Lovely to see you brothers. We are in the month of, without looking in this direction, we are in the month of what? Rajab. The 4th of Rajab, 1444. Which means that how many months has it been since we saw one another in this venue? How long has it been? In the uh, lecture series that we did, called the Life Series, when was that? Uh, it was in the month of Ramadan, last year. So it's been just under a year since we all met in the same venue, and it feels like it was just yesterday. And therefore, every one of you here is one year older. And I'm sure you will know some people who were with us here. I know a few who are now six feet under. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy upon them, they passed away. So a year in the life of a believer who averages 60 to 70 years, a year is a, uh, is a very short time. And we don't have a lot of those years seeing that 60 or 70 is all that you have as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, he said, The average age span of my ummah is 60 to 70 years. He said, But it's only a minority of them who reach that age. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make this Ramadan that's coming in just under two months time a transformational one. Every Ramadan counts. And what better way of a build-up than to talk about Salah? Coming to the month of Ramadan, everyone will be speaking about Siyam, fasting, and rightly so. The emphasis should be put on Siyam. But there is a very important dimension of Ramadan, and that is the nightly Taraweeh Salah and the prayer that you do at home. And for a lot of people, they find themselves enjoying that part of Ramadan more than the fasting. And they find their heart in Salah more than the hours of fasting. So it would be a shame to come into another Ramadan without understanding the inner dimensions of salah, uh, uh, prayer. Imam Muslim narrates on the authority of Uthman ibn Abi al-As. This companion, he came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa with a complaint. I would say it's an international complaint. It's cross borders. And this companion, he said, Ya Rasulullah, Inna shaytana qad hala bayni wa bayna salati wa qiraati yulabbisuha alay. O Messenger of Allah, shaytan has interfered between me and my prayer and the recitation of the Qur'an. He is making me very confused. And so the Prophet ﷺ said to him, ذَاكَ شَيْطَانٌ يُقَالُ لَهُ خِنْزَبْ أَوْ خُنْزَبْ أَوْ خَنْزَبْ He said that is due to the whispering of a shaytan by the name of khinzab. Or you can call him khunzab with a dhamma or khanzab with a fatha. And all of these pronunciations are correct. In other words, there is a shaitan who is dedicated to distracting the believers during their salah. What a low life. This is his job description. To bother people and to distract them and confuse them when they are in salah. And so the Prophet wasallam, after telling him, this is khinzab, he said to him, فَإِذَا أَحْسَسْتَهُ If you feel of his presence, فَتَعَوَّذْ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ Seek refuge in Allah from him. What full and spit dryly to your left three times, like this. Uthman, the narrator, he said, فَفَعَلْتُ ذَلِكْ I did just that. فَأَذْهَبَهُ اللَّهُ عَنِّي And so Allah Jalla Jalalhu took him away from me. The complaint of not being able to pray with khushu'a, which is the word that we're going to be using for the duration of this program, inshallah, for the coming weeks. A prayer without concentration and thought, a salah that is absent-minded, 
is perhaps a complaint that has been made by every Muslim under Allah's heaven, under Allah's sky at one point or another in his or her life. A brother or sister will complain and say to the Imam, Shaykh, student of knowledge, why is it that I don't enjoy my salah? I have been praying for so long, yet I don't feel that it is transforming me in any way, shape or form. Rather, God forbid, may Allah pardon, I feel it is borderline mundane. I feel salah is a little bit boring. It is repetitive. I'm struggling to activate my heart in any way. He says, she says, how is it that other people, I see them in salah, bowing and prostrating with so much attentiveness and focus? How is it that some people, they pray, they pray long hours without feeling the pain because of the joy, the pleasure that they experience in standing before Allah Jalla Jalla? How come? How come some people, they prostrate and it's almost as if they don't want to raise their heads because of that sense of nearness and warmth to Allah Jalla Jalla? And I don't feel any of that. I don't feel any of that in Ramadan or out of Ramadan, during the night or the day prayer. My heart feels dark, it feels stoic. My salah is machine-like, it's chore-like, it's a tick box exercise. I don't enjoy it, it's soulless. Why me? What has become of my salah? So this is an international complaint that is made by all of us at some point or another in our lives. At least by those who are afraid for the welfare of their salah. And I wouldn't also be exaggerating if I was to say that you could enter a huge masjid only to find that not a single one of them is praying in a state of khushu'ah, attentiveness. And those were not my words, those were the words of Hudayfa radiallahu anhu. Hudayfa, the companion, he said, أَوَّلُ مَا تَفْقِدُونَ مِن دِينِكُمْ الْخُشُوعَ he said, the very first thing that you will lose from your religion is khushu'a. The ability to pray in salah in a humble state of attentiveness. The very first thing that will leave you, O Muslims, from your religion is khushu'a. He said, وَآخِرُ مَا تَفْقِدُونَ مِن دِينِكُمْ الصَّلَاةِ And the very last thing that you will bid farewell to with respect to your religion is the salah itself. He said, وَرُبَّ مُصَلِّ لَا خَيْرَ فِيهِ And there may be a person who prays, but there is no good in him. And then he concludes by saying, وَيُوشِكُ أَن تَدْخُلَ الْمَسْجِدَ فَلَا تَرَى فِيهِمْ خَاشِعًا And a time will come when you will enter a masjid and you will see not a single one of them praying in a state of khushu'ah. لا إله إلا how do we emerge from this situation? And how do we change this? First of all, let us identify and focus on this word that we're going to be using, which is called khushu'ah. Uh, how many of you have heard of this word before, by the way? Raise your hand. Ah, oh, good. Who can give us a definition? A definition? Ah, oh, Yeah, a humble state of attentiveness, good. Any other definitions? Hmm. Um, a will. Huh? A will. A will. A will. A will. Yeah, a desire to pray. Okay, good. One more. One more attempt. Somebody said. Focus. 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 Any other meanings? Because so far your definitions are concentrating on what you do here. Huh? Imam Omar. Fear. Okay, so now we're moving on to the discussion of the heart, because fear sits here. Okay, good. So I share with you a linguistic breakdown of the word khushu'ah. Let's get all of the theory out of the way, nice and early, so that in the coming weeks we can focus on what is practical. The scholars, they say that from a linguistic perspective, the word khushu'a, Imam Ibn Qayyim, he says this, and Ibn Faris in his Maqayis al and others, they say, Aslu al khushu'i fi al al inkhifadu wa dhullu wa sukunu. They say the original meaning of the word khushu'a from a linguistic language perspective now, not a technical perspective. Meaning in the day-to-day -day discourse of the Arabs, when they speak about khushu', 
They are referring to three things. Al-inkhifadu, meaning a state of lowering. Descent. Wadhullu, humility. Humbleness, somebody said that. Wasukunu, meaning stillness. Lack of, the opposite of movement, stillness. What are those three meanings? What was the first? Lowering. Number two? Humbleness. Number three? Stillness. How does the Quran use this word khushu'a with the same three meanings? I will share with you. Allah Jalla Jalaluhu said, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ أَنَّكَ تَرَ الْأَرْضَ خَاشِعًا From the signs of Allah Almighty is that you see the land, the earth, khashi'ah, in a state of khushu'ah. What does it mean? Meaning it is lowly, humble, still. فَإِذَا أَنزَلْنَا عَلَيْهَا الْمَاءَ اهْتَزَّتْ وَرَبَتْ But when we cause rain to fall upon that khashi'ah land, it begins to move and vegetation grows from it. So what was the word that Allah Almighty used to describe land that was still and lowly and humble? Khashi'ah. So khushu'ah can be in description of land, not just human beings. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the voices, the volume of the voices of people on the day of judgment. He said, Voices will have khushu' for Allah Rahman on the day of judgment. So you will only hear whispering. You will only hear on that day murmuring. So how does Allah describe voices on the day of judgment that will be low, that will be humbled? He said khashia. So khushua can also be in description of what? Of voices. Humble, low, still, quiet. Khushua can also be description of what? The way you look, the way you uh, observe things and gaze at them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he said about the people on the day of judgment, khushia'an absaruhum yakhrujuna min al ajda. They will come out of their graves with their eyes downcast. Khushya'an. What was the word used to describe the downcast, humble state of people's gaze on the day of judgment? It's the word of khushua again. Do you see how the word khushua is used in the day to day in the Arabic and what it means? Now I transfer you to the technical definition. Meaning, this is the khushua we are speaking about. Meaning, this is the khushu' that Allah instructs you and I to have in our lives and in salah specifically. What is the praiseworthy khushu'? What is the khushu' that you and I are expected to clothe ourselves with? There are def different definitions for this beautiful word khushu'. And one of my favorite definitions was given by Imam Ibn Rajab al Hanbali. Take note of the definition. He said, Al Khushu'u Linu al Qalbi Warqatuhu. Khushu' is when the heart softens and becomes tender. Wa sukunuhu wa khudu'uhu. And when it becomes still and humbled. Wa kisaruhu wa hurqatuhu. And when the heart breaks and it becomes inflamed. That is the state of khushu'ah Allah Jalla Jalaluhu wants from my heart and yours. In salah and outside of salah. And do you see where he got his words from? Where he plucked out the definition from? The original meaning has meanings of humbleness and stillness, lowliness and descent. All of that is found in the technical definition. A heart that is what? Hear it again. Tender and soft. And a heart that is still and humble. And a heart that is broken and inflamed. That isn't to say that you have to have some weak, fragile heart living in your life and always coming second and third place. No. As a Muslim, you are strong. Al-Mu'minun qawi khayrun wa ahabbu ila Allahi min al-Mu'min da'if. The strong believer is more beloved to Allah and closer to him than the weak believer. 
you know, you are strong and you are decisive and you are positive and you are optimistic and you are proactive and you come first in your races, the religious ones and otherwise. Muslim doesn't come second place. But your relationship with Allah Jalla Jalaluhu is defined by vulnerability, weakness, and humility, a broken heart, and a heart that is inflamed. Inflamed with what? Love for Allah and fear of Allah and passion for Allah and regret for your sins that you did against Allah Jalla Jalaluhu and a yearning to be near Allah Jalla Jalaluhu. And then Ibn Rajab he concludes the definition by saying, Therefore, if the heart experiences khushu' what happens? He said, therefore, when the heart experiences khushu' every other one of the limbs will follow suit and will have khushu' Because he says the limbs, they follow the heart. So where does khushu' begin? Is it outward to inward or is it inward to outward? Which one? Inward to outward. Meaning when you see someone behaving with khushu' you have a window into his heart. Through his body behavior, through his limbs, her movements, that you understand this is an individual of khushu'. So when the heart experiences this beautiful characteristic of khushu' to Allah that we have just defined, it appears in their gaze. It appears in their body language, in the words that they choose. It appears in their ability to give an apology to accept an apology, to amend the broken relationship. They're not arrogant anymore. Why? Because their heart has khushu'. They have the ability to change their financial transactions. If there is haram, why? Because the heart has khushu'. It appears in her hijab. It appears in how he presents himself on social media. It appears how you behave when someone sends you that DM. Why? Because your heart is in a state of khushu'. And therefore that translates online and offline and physically and metaphysically and inwardly and outwardly in your salah, outside of your salah, at home and in public, private and public, because the heart is in a state of khushu. So we have just discovered one thing. If you have not taken any way, anything from this so far, take away this one message, which is the home of khushu is where? Is it in the eyes, the body, or where, does, where is the home of khushu, brothers? It is the heart. And that is the secret why a lot of people misunderstand the khushu'a. So he thinks that now the moment I say Allahu Akbar and I begin my salah, I'm, I'm going to close my eyes and I'm going to raise my shoulders a little bit and I'm going to arch my back and khushu'a is going to appear. But it doesn't. What happened? This person had the false, mistaken, implicit understanding that khushu'a begins outwardly and then it goes inwardly. No. Khushu'a starts in with you. And if the khushu'a is here, it then extends its roots to your limbs, and then it appears outwardly. And with this definition, we've understood something else. We've just implicitly understood why a lot of us struggle with the concept of khushu'a. Why it's such a battle for a lot of us. Because if the home of khushu'a is the heart, then what do you do when the heart is busy? What do you do if the heart is stuffed with all sorts of passion and desire and prohibited images and videos and music and songs and innovations and lusts that are overflowing from the heart? There's no space for khushu'a. Where is it going to go? And Allah said, مَا جَعَلَ اللَّهُ لِرَجُلٍ مِّنْ قَلْبَيْنِ فِي جَوْفِهِ Allah has not given any man two hearts in him. So if that one heart is busy, where is khushu' going to go? So you're about to begin your salah, Imam says, Allahu Akbar, and you say, this is it. This will be the salah that I will do with khushu'. And you try to cram khushu' into your heart, but you find that it is slipping from side to side. It's not settling. Why? Because the heart is overflowing with haram. So where is khushu' going to go? And you know that sins are presented primarily to where? Whether you look at them, you hear them, or you say them, or you inject them, or smoke them, or consume them. Doesn't matter. Where is the sin presented primarily? This is the helipad. This is where they land. Sins land here. 
So the khushu' or the hat is like the RAM of, of your PC. If the RAM is busy, then the processing speeds are going to be undermined. And similarly, if your heart is busy with haram, your ability to pray and live with khushu'ah will also be what? Will also be undermined. So we want to escape this reality, especially now in the build-up to the month of Ramadan. And we want to change all of this. And we're going to start a long journey. I don't know how long it's going to take. It could be two months. It could be uh, ten weeks. It could be more. But I'm not in a rush to end it anytime soon. Because we're speaking about the second most important pillar in our religion after the Shahada, and that is the Salah. And seeing that you are doing it not once or twice, but five times a day. You and I are invested in knowing how to take the most out of this Salah. So, so far, we have defined the word khushu' from an Arabic linguistic perspective. And I've given you a working definition to use for the rest of this program, inshallah ta'ala. Now, the question that poses itself here is, what is in it for me? I need buy-in from you. If this course is actually going to go on for 12 weeks, 13, 14 weeks, we need buy it. We need to make sure that we're all invested in this study. So we ask the question and we set the scene. What is in it for us when we achieve this goal of praying with khushur? What happens? Allahu Akbar. Let me give you a tour of some of the prophetic narrations. And you will realize to what extent we had been depriving ourselves by not giving this topic its due attention. Our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in the hadith which Abu Dawood narrates on the authority of Ubad ibn Samit. He said, Khamsu salawatin iftaradahun Allahu Ta'ala. There are five daily prayers that Allah has enjoined. Listen. Man ahsana wudu'ahun. Here are the conditions. Whoever perfects the wudu, the pre-washing prayer. Whoever perfects the wudu of these prayers. Wasallahunna liwaqtihin and carries them out on their due time, doesn't delay them. And perfects the bowing of those prayers and perfects their khushu'ah. What happens? This person has a pact with Allah, an agreement, a promise that Allah would erase his sins. He said, وَمَنْ لَمْ يَفْعَلْ Whoever does not do this, فَلَيْسَ لَهُ عَهْدٌ مِنَ اللَّهِ He does not have this type of agreement. إِنْ شَاءَ غَفَرَ لَهُ وَإِنْ شَاءَ عَذَّبَهُ If Allah wills, He will punish him. And if Allah wills, He will pardon him. لا إله إلا الله A daily and a nightly opportunity on numerous times of the day and night for you to have all of your sins erased through a salah on condition that is what? It is with khushu'ah. He said, and perfects it khushu'ah. What else? Our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in the hadith which the Muslim narrates on the authority of Uqbat ibn Amr. He said, مَا مِنْ أَحَدٍ يَتَوَضَّأُ فَيُحْسِنُ الْوُضُوءُ Any person who does the wudu, the pre-prayer washing, and perfects it. ثُمَّ يُصَلِّ رَكْعَتَيْنِ And then carries out two units of salah. On what condition? يُقْبِلُوا بِوَجْهِهِ وَبِقَلْبِهِ عَلَيْهِمَا On condition that he gives them his face and his heart. What happens? إِلَّا وَجَبَتْ لَهُ الْجَنَّةِ Paradise becomes incumbent upon this person. You have to enter Jannah. A daily opportunity to secure for yourself a home in Jannah. Why are we here in the masjid other than a desire to enter Jannah and reach the pleasure of Allah? Anybody who perfects his wudu carries out two units of salah. Look how many opportunities you want to have, you and I have throughout the day. On condition that he perfects or he gives Allah his face and his khushu'ah, paradise becomes incumbent upon him. La ilaha illallah. Now on the flip side, these are some of the opportunities. On the flip side of all of this, there are also consequences for those who delay the study of the topic of khushu'ah and fail to live by khushu'ah and show no interest to reform their salah and make it one of khushu'ah. There is also a threat here. In a hadith which I think some of you will be hearing for the first time, the Prophet said, as Abu Dawood narrates in his Sunan on the authority of Ammar ibn Yasir, 
He said, "Inna rajula la yansarifu wa ma kutiba lahu min salatihi illa ushruha, tusuha, thumnuha, subuha, sudsuha, khumsuha, rubuha, thulthuha, nisfuha." Subhanallah. He said, some people will walk away from their salah and the only reward that Allah has written for them is a tenth of it. He said, a ninth of it, an eighth of it, a seventh of it, a sixth of it, a fifth of it, a quarter of it, a third of it, half of it. What is it that differentiates your salah from my salah and his salah from her salah? What is it that makes our salah so different in the eyes of Allah? One of those defining factors is our state of khushu'ah. Some people walk away, as you heard, with just a tenth of the salah. Some people walk away with a quarter of the reward. Some people have half. Some people, perhaps, we hope, will have the full reward. What is the secret? Abdullah ibn Abbas, he said, لَيْسَ لَكَ مِن صَلَاتِكَ إِلَّا مَا عَقَلْتَ مِنْهَا The only thing you will have from your salah is that which you remember and were conscious when performing. The only reward, he says, that you will have for your salah is that which you recall. And that is why Imam Ibn Qayyim, he said, SubhanAllah, beautiful words. He said, Ar-rajulani yakunu Wal-rajulani yakunani fi saffi wa fi al-maqami wahidan wa baynahuma fi al-ajri kama bayna al-samai wa al-ard. He said, there may be two people who are praying side by side in the masjid, carrying out the same prayer. Same masjid, same salah, same movements. He said, but the difference between them in terms of reward is like the difference between the heavens and the earth. What is the defining factor? The presence of heart and the focus and the lowliness, the humbleness, that inflamed and broken heart that we spoke about. Tender and soft heart before Allah Jalla Jalaluhu. How much of your salah do you want to take when you finish? Now seeing you can't run away from five daily prayers a day. You just can't run away from it. This is an obligation till the day you die. Since you're doing it both ways, why not take as much as you can from it? Do you see why we are here to study khushu'ah? Because without it, we are depriving ourselves from so many hasanat. We don't want a prayer that just qualifies as a prayer. We don't want a salah that is simply a tick box in the eyes of Allah. You did it, but you are on the edge. That's not the salah we want. We want a salah that transcends all of this, that is above this, that increases you in ubudiyah, worship to Allah, surrendering to Allah, transforms your life. So people walk away with different levels of reward from salah on the basis of khushwa. What else? There is another threat. Ahmed narrates in his Musnad and Al-Hakim in his Mustadrak that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Aswa'u nasi sariqatan alladhi yasriqu fi salatih. The worst type of thieves, he said, are those who steal during salah. And so the companions, they said, Wa kayfa yasriqu ahaduna fi salatih, ya Rasulullah, a messenger of Allah, how do people steal during their salah? It seems a little bit inconceivable. He said, لا يتم ركوعها ولا سجودها ولا خشوعها It is when a person does not perfect the bowing and prostrating and khushu of salah. That's how you steal during salah. And it is, as the scholars, they say, the worst type of theft because you're doing it in the masjid. And you're doing it as you stand before Allah, Al-Malik, the sovereign of the heavens and the earth. Stealing. When you stand between your Lord, Al-Malik, the king, and there is no tarjuman, and no hajib, no interpreter, no solicitor speaking on your behalf between you and Allah Jalla Jalla. Direct contact. And during that contact, you steal, I steal. How do we steal? When we don't perfect the bowing, we don't perfect the prostration, we don't perfect the khushu' of the salah. Do you see why we are here? There is so much to gain, and there is also so much to, so much to lose out on. Therefore, dear uh, brothers and sisters, there is a, uh, also a beautiful statement made by Imam Al-Qayyim. He said, He said, each individual will stand twice before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, the first standing 
is when you stand before Allah during salah. You are standing before your Lord. He said the second standing is when you will stand before him on the day of resurrection to be asked about your deeds. And then he gives you the thunderbolt. Imam ibn al-Qayyim says, therefore, whoever perfects the first standing, his salah, he prays it diligently on time and gives it attention, Allah will make the second standing easy for him before Allah. And whoever neglects the first standing, meaning the salah, and abuses it, Allah will make the second standing very arduous, challenging, and difficult. So these are some of the things to expect by the end of this program, if Allah accepts from us and allows us to pray with, to pray with khushwa.